today. Um, tonight, we have a very exciting um, guest with us. Um, we've been having a series of workshops by our Gadget Geeks. If you don't know who our Gadget Geeks are, you can visit our um, website at urbangadgets.ph and um, click the tab Gadget Geeks. Okay, so we've been having like a series of workshops covering different topics um, by our different Gadget Geeks. And tonight we are joined by one of them. Uh, and I'm so, so uh, proud to be the one to introduce him. Um, he's a landscape and travel photographer and he spearheads photography tours and workshops around the globe. So actually for anyone who's, who's with us tonight, who's a photographer, um, you probably know who he is. And if you don't, well, then after this workshop, you're sure to remember his name. His advocacy um, is to promote photography and help people reach their creative potential. So uh, he's also a Canon brand ambassador for the Philippines. He's our influencer for DJI here at Urban Gadgets, also for Peak Design brand. And um, he's a cover for the first issue of Digital Photographer in Italy. How amazing is that, right? He's also a contributor for National Geographic Adventure and for Canon Asia Snapshot. And he's featured on so many international publications. So we're really, really, really excited to have him with us tonight. And actually, um, his workshops are paid workshops. So we're really, really fortunate that tonight, he's hosting this workshop for free for all of you who have drones and are wanting to learn how to take um, proper pictures with them. So I guess um, I won't take up your time any longer. Here to present um, our aerial photography workshop under Gadget Geeks, Urban Gadgets, Mr. Edwin Martinez. Breathtaking. It was like a dream. A painting. A painting where you can live in. It takes me. It captures me. It always leaves me in awe. This is how landscapes fascinate me. It makes me want to freeze time every time I see this painted light scenery with my two eyes. This is the reason why I continue living the story. The story within the photographs of this awesome scenery. Going back and forth just to experience the awesome wonders of this world. It's beautiful. It's beautifully made. That capturing this picture-perfect landscape is just what I need. What we all need. Living the story behind the photos is what we need. I am Edwin Martinez travel and landscape photographer and Canon Crusader of Light.
Hi, everyone. So again, welcome to Urban Gadgets uh, Workshops, Gadget Geeks Workshop. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank Christelle for introducing me. And I'm always um, happy to be with the Urban Gadgets family. So right now, I'm here to provide you some information or lectures about uh, aerial or drone landscape photography. And um, before I start, I'd like to to cite a little things now about my my history on on where I got started with drone drone photography now. So I've been traveling around the world, uh, mostly in Iceland, Norway, U.S. and Canada. But um, the problem with the U.S. and Canada, they're very strict with the drone regulations. But in Europe, especially Iceland, uh, as long as you follow their basic rules, you can fly anywhere as long as there's not much people. Which in the case of Iceland, there's not much people except tourists okay and um, well I did start there and also here in the Philippines when I go out like uh, three hours away from Manila I try to practice and eventually I fell in love with it because it shows you a different perspective a different view and that's the title of my workshop anyway before I start formally start if you have any questions you can just put it in the comments and I'll answer them from time to time and we're giving away five prizes, no uh, tokens, uh, care of Urban Gadgets for the top five questions related to my lecture. Okay, so Urban Gadgets will choose them, and then they will send, uh, they will contact you and send you your giveaways. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so I think it's good. Okay, so let me start with this one. So there's a lot of components with uh, with my lecture. So I'd like to start off with the core concepts of um, drone photography. And, um, and after that, um, some safety and uh, pre-flight checklist, um, then composition, uh, settings and settings of your drone, then composition, and finally, a little bit of post-processing, okay? Um, I'd just like to check if it's showing already. Okay, it's showing. Okay, hold on. Okay, is it showing? Let's see. Okay, so there's many questions right now here, and um, like uh, I'll answer them one by one, like composition or permits. Um, I will tackle them. It's all in the lecture. So um, we're just shifting so that we can show our. We can. I can. I can show my. Uh, there we go. Share. And then. There we go. So I'm just checking if uh, everything is A-OK. -okay. OK, so we can officially start. So. My presentation is um, about drone landscape photography, and uh, it's called A Different View. Um, I'm a landscape photographer, and most of my shots are taken with a DSLR, so these are the kind of shots I have. Um, and uh, this was taken in Mayon with a 
with a DSLR uh, with an ultra wide angle lens. Okay. Um, this was taken in Iceland. So these are the typical shots that you can get from the ground when you want to go near your your subjects or your foreground element, then sunset and uh, interest layers. Now, drone landscape photography presents a different view, a different perspective. It can magnify the majestic landscape, like this one. This was taken in Iceland, the highlands of Iceland. A normal camera or vantage point would not be able to show how grand the landscape is. So this one I took with the Mavic Air 2, uh, Mavic Pro 2, and you can see you have the glacier river on your left and the uh, three volcanoes no, or three, three or four volcanic craters, okay? And of course the mountain ranges. This was taken in Iceland. So normally a camera would not be able to take this, a normal DSLR. With the advent of drone photography, it's much easier to get this, this kind of scene. No? And it can also be not about the grand landscape. You can also project intimate landscapes that are unique or abstracts that are unique. So this is one of the craters of the picture I've shown before. And the white dot is the our van no? that we ride during the tour. So it really provides you a new perspective, a new view of the world. And this is what I'd like to present. And these are the two volcanoes or craters with the road in the middle. Um, it's very hard to, to, to get this kind of shots before. And uh, I'd like to tackle some of the history of, of, lands, of drone photography, okay? So the evolution of aerial photography before, it's quite hard. You have to rent um, either an airplane or helicopter. Okay, um, it's very expensive. So most photographers like the Nat Geo or guys who have assignments with Time Magazine or et cetera, they, they, they rent out airplanes. And it costs a lot, like $5,000 to $10,000, okay? So these were the only options. The first was the airplane, then a helicopter, and then the drone came out. But the drones during the first phase were bulky, they're big. And they use a DSLR as a, sta as a, as a camera. And um, it's also very expensive. A uh, quadcopter or hexacopter or heptacopter during that time was costing about 100,000 100, pesos to 200,000 pesos. Then DJI came out with UAV or the un unmanned air, v uh, air, air system. No? And they came out with the... Um, a lot of uh, products, no? this one, and then it got smaller with the Mavic, okay, with the Phantom, the Mavic, and the um, Air. So it got less expensive and more accessible to a lot of people. And I've seen a lot of drone photography shots, and it blew my mind. So that's why at an early stage, I joined in. No? I had the Phantom 4 Pro before. And then I went to a smaller one because I had the problem carrying the Phantom 4 Pro. For me, it was still too big, especially during my travel. And then came the Mavic, and it was perfect for me. It was a perfect marriage. So Mavic for me, um, just the right size, not too big, not too small. Okay. Now, one of the persons I really looked up to and also um, opened my eyes to to aerial landscape photography was Hans Strand. Back in 2010, I think, I went to Vancouver in Canada. And in their airport, they had this like huge exhibition of his works, no? He started, he actually inspired me to, to go into landscape or to drone landscape photography. And um, he's also a uh, Hasselblad master, no, Hans Strand. But most of his shots were taken in aerial, aerials of Iceland, Norway, Sweden. He's based in Europe. And that made me interested in it. But it was too expensive at that time, no? But right now, it's not an exclusive club for people with money or influence, okay? So for those who are hobbyists, they can buy a drone and just travel out like three to four hours away from Manila and they can 
practice and get landscape photo, land, uh, drone landscape shots that are unique. Okay, um, like this one. This was taken in um, Norway in Lofoten. So there's this long road in the middle of the fjord with two bridge, no. And I took the shot just last year, just before the pandemic. Okay, so aerial drone photography. It made it accessible to a wide, uh, wider public, especially with the DJI drone products. Um, there's a wider choice of uh, UAV equipment. So you have, for the more professional, you have inspired and semi-professional. You have the Phantom series. Then you have the Mavic, which is also semi-professional. Then you have the Mavic Air, Mavic Mini. So there's a lot of options right now. And it made it, more easy or easier for people to get into drone landscape photography and for me the the greatest i think um gift of this products were it's, it's smaller packaging um used uh, i used to travel a lot with my phantom 4 pro and it was so hard because it's bulky it's a separate backpack with my camera, with DSLR, two camera bodies, and the Phantom 4 Pro, I always get, you know, stop at the at the by by at the immigrant uh, the airline checks or the airport checks um, on the weight of the carry on luggage, and it was really it was really messy. So now the question is, which drone is for you? So there was a question here. Uh, those with limited budget to buy gears for landscape photography, if drone photography itself there's you have to you have to ask that question yourself no so what is the right drone for you are you a enthusiast are you an ama amateur photographer do you do photography as a side sideline like weddings etc then you have to partner your choice with what you're doing no so it depends on the purpose okay is it more on video is it more on photo okay so if it's more on video so you have to look at the specs, 4K, full HD, how many frames per second. For photo, is it uh, one inch sensor or one and two thirds? So it's up to you. No, um, I cannot tell you which is the best out there in the market. But right now, personally, I'm using the Mavic 2 Pro with a Hasselblad camera. Um, size and portability is also very important, especially if you're traveling. Um, the Mavic Mini right now, it's really looking good. Uh, uh, a lot of people are, are a lot of photographers are saying it's with the size, with the how effective it is. It's also available right now in the market, especially at Urban Gadgets. Um, is it for personal or commercial? So if it's more in commercial, then you have to go to the higher end, Inspire or or the Phantom series. No. Now um, I always tell this to a lot of people when asking. Uh, what to buy, what gear to buy. You know? um, I always tell them, buy it right the first time or you'll end up spending more. Like, for example, you'll buy a, let's say, Mavic Air. And then later on, you saw that the image quality isn't good, so you need to go to Mavic, Mavic Pro 2 or Mavic 2 Pro. So it just adds to your... To your expenses. You, know? you have to sell your Mavic Mini or Mavic Air to a to a lesser value, then you have to buy the brand new one. So it's it's wrong, no? So always buy it right the first time. So it's less expensive. So as I said, Urban Gadgets, they have a lot of deals. Um, they are sponsoring this workshop. So check out their, their websites or their Facebook and they have lots of deals coming out, no? So just check it out. Now, when choosing also a drone, I always, uh, tell them also that the sensor and field of view is very important. Um, the bit rate, it's also important, but much more on video. Um, I'm more concerned on the sensor because I'm more into photography and also the field of view. So there are many sensors. Like, for example, um, uh, this this uh, models like this, the old models, they have a one and two thirds. Uh, then they have the Mavic uh Mavic 1, which is also 1 and 2 thirds and 28 millimeter. Then you have the Mavic uh, Air, 1 and 2 thirds at 24 millimeter. The Phantom, 1 inch and 24 millimeter. The Mavic 2 Pro, 
has one inch sensor. So what do I mean by one inch sensor? So you could imagine this. Um, this is how much information a sensor could capture. A one and two third sensor, Spark, Mavic Air, and the Mavic, Mavic Pro 1 can only capture this small information. The sensor size of the Phantom 4 Pro and Mavic 2 Pro are one inch. So this is a graphic representation of the size of the sensor and how much information it can capture. So for me, if you're more into photography and videos, quality videos, and you make it, you sell them or you're, it's part of your job, then I suggest you get a one-inch sensor, okay? There. So tips on having your first drone, read the reviews. Um, before you buy, I suggest read the reviews. Check out you, uh, YouTube. You check out... Um, uh, most uh, drone uh, review websites, okay, Google it. Then after buying it, know your gear. Um, is it number one? Uh, is the size uh, appropriate to you? Can you travel with it? The batteries, check it because there's some issues with some batteries that bloats up easily, so you have to check those. Then know your software. I think that this is the most important. Um, a lot of people, they don't read the manual which is wrong, no? So my rule in photography is first, read the manual. Second, read the manual. Third, practice. Fourth, read the manual again. So it's the same thing. So the software that you need to, to, you know, to get acquainted or get familiar with is the DJI Go app, and it's very important. Um, so to end my first phase of my lecture, this is a panoramic shot, a 180 panoramic shot of uh, Landmannalaugar in Iceland. So this is a very popular place during summer uh, with all the volcanic and the mossy green landscape. It's like, it looks like Mars or a different planet. You know? So um, I took this shot with the Mavic 2 Pro uh, back in 2019. And uh, I, for me, I could never get the shot with a normal DSLR. So this one for me um, is an absolute uh, appreciation of the gear that I have right now, which is the Mavic 2 Pro. Okay, so what are the elements of a great aerial pho photograph? Um, I think this is very important. Um, in photography, you have these core concepts that you look for. What do you look for when you try to get a good, La drone landscape photography. So I'd like to tackle each and every one of them. So first is light and colors. They're very important in any photo, in, in video, in any art form. Maybe it in video or photography, it is very important, okay? So you have to, mm, so you have to, you have to look for this, okay? So how do you look for this? So Look at this shot, no? So this was taken in Lofoten. Um, it was nearing, it was it was golden hour and it was nearing sunset. And I saw that this um, snow clouds were coming in and the sun was still high above the horizon. And I knew that when that cloud goes to the sun, it would create this color, this, 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 um, 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 what do you call this, uh, colors, um, warm colors or uh, moody colors, no? So right on the dot, I was there up in the air when it happened and I got the shot. This is a vertical panorama. I'll explain later what are your options when photographing with using your drones, no? So what do you look for in lights and colors? So first, proper exposure. Um, later on, I'll discuss uh, in in the settings the histogram, no? So when you look at your phone or your tablet or your DJI, DJI remote and the screen, it will present itself there with the histogram. So you always look at your histogram. So proper exposure is very important. Then of course, time of day. I'm not saying fly your drone during sunset or sunrise because it's gonna be too dark. Um, a slower shutter speed would have um, camera shakes because your drone is flying. Even on a tripod mode, 
it's very hard. So I usually go in between golden hour and just before sunset or sunrise. Sunrise, then just going to golden light. You know? So you have enough light, um, noise is acceptable, and you, have, you can properly expose it with fast shutter speed. Okay. Then design and dynamics. Um, I have... Uh, I have actually a module just for design and dynamics. So you guys, you have to learn that not because you have a drone, it's a different vantage point. Anything you shoot is unique or is good or is beautiful. You have to be careful also with your composition. And it is harder to compose using a drone. It's easier with your DSLR actually, but when it's all the way up there, 150 meters or 900 feet or 700 feet or 150 feet or which is ever allowed, it is very hard to compose, okay? So, and, and you only have like 20, 20 to 25 minutes to fit as much as possible the shots that you want because one battery is like 20 minutes or 25 minutes, okay? Uh, so that's it. So design and dynamics. So what do we look for in design and dynamics, which I'll tackle later. Uh, geometrics, meaning circular, rectangular shapes. Contrast, the use of dynamic lines. You have to look for those leading lines. No? So I'll, I'll, I'll tackle more later on when we go to that part of the module. So here are some samples. This was taken in Iceland. Uh, this is one of the... Um, this is one of the islands, pseudo craters. There's actual pseudo craters in the middle of the lake, Lake Mivat. This is in the north of Iceland. And believe it or not, this is not Photoshop. You can see two heart shapes, actually three, but the other one is not as prominent as the other two. And these are actual shots, the actual shapes that I found, okay? And this one, it's also there, but uh, taken during winter. So when I was flying it, I wanted to take the road shots, but I saw this unique patterns on the ground. These are actual tire marks made by people who are going on a U-turn or parking. And I saw that it was quite unique. You know? So I took the shot. So, sorry, I was just checking if you have any questions. Uh, so I can answer them later on after the first module. No? So, the third element is the element of moment. You have to pick the right moment. Um, like this shot, this was taken in Vic in Iceland, and there was a mist or fog coming in and rolling alongside the cliff. No, so I immediately took out my drone, flew it out. The rain wasn't starting, but I knew it would start in any minute. So for me to get this shot, I just took one shot. Then it started to rain, and then I just you know, just uh, landed my, 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 my drone um, just before the rain started. So moments are very important. So what moments do you want to, to, to photograph? As I said, golden hour to sunset or sunrise to golden hour, then atmospheric phenomena or weather phenomena like fog, um, starburst, uh, moody clouds. So those are the things that you want, you want to capture. No? So, when you have all these elements, you, know, you have light and colors. This was taken during, during, uh, in Lofoten during uh, golden hour when the sun was going down. So you have light and colors. Then you have design and dynamics. I have this, this bridge as a leading line. And then I have moments, which is this one. The, the clouds were covering the, the sun, creating like a misty or moody shot, no? So when all of them are together, you create harmony in your photo. So usually when you have these three ingredients in your shot, you create harmony in your photo. And I think that's a very important aspect that you look for, okay? So, but the problem is not, not every time you can have those three, no? Most of the time, light and colors are the ones that missing, especially light, because you don't have any control when you try to photograph and light is not as fantastic, no? So what do you do, no? So usually you add more design and dynamics. So it's all about composition. So like this one, it's moody, there's no light, but I wanted to get the, 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 the glacier river running through the valley, you know? So I got the curve 
encircling the the mountain so it's very important um it's very important to 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 choose your design okay your design dynamics so this one again is 180 degree panorama and this one is also 180 degree panorama so it's moody weather i said okay i'll just use colors and and uh, and use the composition for the lack of better light so what i did was put the i captured the the, the crater with with the water in it and i just captured the majestic and grand uh, the grand scene in um, in, the, in the highlands of Iceland, okay? So like this one also, this was taken just recently, um, I think uh, November last year. Uh, this is uh, Mount Cristobal, okay? So Mount Cristobal and Mount Banahaw, this is Mount Cristobal. Uh, I took this in uh, Bangkong Kaho in Dolores, Quezon, and this is a horizontal panorama, um, so basically, the clouds were coming in, and the light was fantastic on top of the mountain. I flew my drone and tried to capture the mountains and the clouds, especially the light playing on the tip of the mountain. You know? So it's very important. So that's it for the first part. Maybe I can answer the question. I can go back to to stop. Uh, maybe there's stop sharing. There we go. So let's, uh, any question, Crystal, that we can check? Maybe I can check here. So, paano po napipili ang composition sa aerial photography by Jonil? No? Um, I'll discuss it later, as I told you. Um, it's more on geometrics eh? so, and contrast and colors. So, later on, I'll answer that question. So, do you need permit every time in one place when you fly a drone? I'll tackle this also later in the safety guidelines. Um, most of the time, hindi mo naman kailangan ng permit if it's more on if you're an enthusiast no but if you fly within the metro or cities or near airports i think you would need a a license or a cap registration for that no? uh what's your advice for people with limited budget to buy gears for landscape photography and how do you keep your passion alive wow very general question no? so in terms of budget um I suggest just buy what you need. Um, try to maximize what your current tool is. And if your tool isn't enough to, to handle your talent or your output, then I think it's time you upgrade. No? So, yun lang sinasabi ko. You only upgrade when you feel that your camera or your lens is limiting you already to what you can do. Um, how to keep the passion alive? Now, that's a very tough, you know, especially during the pandemic. Um, my suggestion is that you, you keep being inspired. You know? um, for me, I always look at Instagram and the works of, of other photographers. And when I see something good, I always dissect how they did it. And yun, so it keeps my passion alive. You know? Not only uh, being inspired, but also being competitive. Not to other photographers, but to yourself. I always like to outdo what I did last time. So, for example, if I travel back to Iceland, I won't take the same pictures, but I will challenge myself to take a better picture of my last shot. So, I think it's more of attitude. No? So, that's enough for questions right now. Um, let's proceed to the next. So, shout out lang sa mga... Umaten. So we have uh, Sir Jonathan Tabisora. Uh, he's the owner of Urban Gadgets. Hello, sir. Rob Vargas, JM Calagos, Fritz Medalia, Gerald Gonzalez. Okay, so hi and everyone to you guys for watching. So just keep on asking. We have five prizes for the top five questions that Urban Gadgets will pick. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Okay. And then let's go to the second. Okay. So are we good? Are we good? Is the screen showing? Let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm just waiting. No, may lag lang dun sa phone ko. Okay. So we're ready. So, um, um, the second 
um, part of the module is all about safety and how you prepare your drones. I think this is very important. It's, um, a lot of people, when they have drone, they, they fly it immediately, you know? So safety and preparation, I think it's very important. Um, so look at this picture. Um, these are pictures of drones that have crashed. No, I got some are some are from my trips in Iceland. Some I got from from the internet. No, um, when you buy a drone, I think the most important mindset that I can give you as a piece of advice is that you have to be prepared that your drone will either get lost or will get broken. Okay. Number one, there's so many things that you cannot do while it's in the air. You have no control whatsoever. And you have to prepare yourself. Dapat handa kang mawala ang drone mo. Okay? In, in, in Filipino. It's because if you always have that notion of being careful, then you will never maximize the potential of your drones. Okay? I'll repeat that. If you do not accept that somewhere along the way or in the future you will lose your drone, you will always be held back by the notion that your drone is going to get lost and you will never be able to maximize the potential of your drones in terms of photography or videography, okay? So uh, these are some samples of what can happen you know, in the future. So you have to prepare yourself. Edwin, have you crashed your drone? Yes. My very first drone was a Phantom 4 Pro. I broke it. My Mavic 2, um, almost. Um, one of the LSE actually was broken, but that's it. Uh, there was a magnetic interference on one of the mountains. So when I was trying to bring it back, the LSE got hit. And luckily, it still flew, but it was flying like like uh, wiggly. But I was able to land it. So and hopefully, there's no more. Okay. So, yeah. So these are the some of the things that you can expect now one of the aspects that i'd like to tackle is that a drone is not a toy um i've seen a lot of i i, I joined a lot of groups here uh, which are philippine based or uh, which are uh, which are particular to drone photography or videography and they have this called ninja move you no know? they fly in the city they fly without any license or certificate and it's um, actually um I, 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 I pity those people because if anything happens, if it's like it destroys a property, you're flying it in the city, then you lose control and it destroys a car, no? Um, it's very expensive. You lose the drone and you have to pay for the damages, property damages. Now, that's a good thing if it falls, it, it falls on a property, but if it, what if it costs damage to a person no? or or you know an accident causes to an injury you know so this is um, a picture of a kid actually um if you search on the, in the internet the, the very first drones especially in europe and the us they weren't that strict but because of this boy restrictions were given no so oscar webb lost uh, one of his his right eye because the lc of the drone sliced into it and I, I heed to my, my, the, those who are watching and those who have, um, are drone owners not to fly if there's a lot of people here or if you're flying in the city. You mga ninja move na yan, yes, you're good. But unfortunately, if an accident happens, nasa huli ang pagsisisi. Okay? So, yun. So be careful, no? Me, I, I've never flew inside the city why number one i'm an enthusiast i only li like to take landscapes when i have projects that need drones i get people who have certification and experience flying it manually um atti no so at least if anything happens you know, it's their fault <laughs> um but for me i'm not confident yet to do it here in the city no? So, UAV or unmanned aerial vehicle. No, this is the term given to any drone. So, all drones 
uh, if you go to if you go and research um, like regulations in Iceland or Norway, do not pro, do not search uh, drone regulations. You put UAV. It's called an un unmanned aerial vehicle. Okay. So general rules for flying a drone in the Philippines. Um, so these are this is the the laws um, or the ordinance here, which is being handled by CAAP, no. So to fly a drone for commercial purpose or fly a drone that weighs 7 kilograms or 50 pounds or more, you need to obtain a certificate from CAAP. Um, you can only fly during day. Um, usually nighttime, you cannot fly your drone in the Philippines. It's against CAAP regulations and in good weather. Uh, so do not let the drone fly outside of your visual line of sight, no? Um, usually, mga iba may spotter pa sila, but for me, you should know where which direction or your drone you have a line of sight to it. Do not fly over populated areas such as schools or marketplaces. Do not fly higher than 400 feet above ground level. Do not fly closer than 30 meters from a group of persons not involved in drone operation. Do not fly closer than 10 kilometers from airports. Actually, you cannot fly it, especially with, if you have an updated DJI Go app. No? Do not fly near emergencies like fires, uh, catastrophes. No, So they're against it. So these are the things that you have to remember or general rules uh, for flying a drone in the Philippines. You can search it. There's a CAAP ordinance. Um, you can easily find it and you can easily download it. Okay. So um, let's go back more on, on, on you know, um, what I do when I'm in the field and I'm going to fly my drone. So what do I do? So I have a pretty um, um, standard procedure before I fly my, pre, uh, my, my drone. No? It's a pre-flight checklist. So it usually involve, involves area environment, your equipment, and me as a flyer. So let's discuss uh, each and every one of them. So area environment, usually when you're in the location, you look for the three Ps. So proximity, do you have any magnetic interference? Airports or any major um, establishments, no? private properties. So those are things that you have to look for, proximity. Usually I would drop, download UAV, uh, UAV pilot or UAV forecast, UAV forecast, and it would show you the nearest airports or helicopter pads near you. So I, at least this one, you'll be, a, be able to find out. No, I'll say it shows there. So another P during the location is people. So you look, if there's a group of people, there's too much people. I would not fly a drone if there's too many people. Property, so is it a private property? Usually if you fly over a private property, you need a permit, okay? Then um, for air environment, weather. Weather is very important. So. Uh, winds below 10 meters per second or 30 kilometers per hour is good. Anything above, it's your choice. No, I've flown my Mavic 2 Pro on um, 15 to 18 meters per second, but above that, I would not fly it. No, okay. precipitation, especially rain. I have not yet seen any drone that is waterproof. No? Um, I think there is, but it's not DJI. You know. So you have to look at it. Also temperature, if it's below minus 10 Celsius or below 10 Celsius, look at your battery immediately because cold usually would drain your battery faster. So that, those are the things that you have to check. Okay, equipment. So general inspection, check your prop propellers. Does it have a chip? It's still straight. Motor, try to check your motor first. So before I fly, I check my motor first if there's no like sand or something during the landing or or take off there's sand in the motor so you clean it battery always check your battery especially if it's bloated a lot of people they don't check their battery they put their batteries there and it's bloated and during the flight it pops off bye bye drone okay always check your battery you cycle your battery i have not encountered yet any of my batteries uh, that became bloated because i cycled them and I also drain them before I put them to storage, okay? Gimbal and camera. Always check your gimbal and camera. A lot of people, they forget to take off their... So when you turn it on, 
um, immediately remove the gimbal cover because if you don't, wh when it when it um, checks the the gimbal, it moves the gimbal automatic movement, uh, and there's the cover. It might destroy uh, the gimbal. Okay, then micro SD. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, my 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 tour clients who fl flies their drone and it flies a few kilometers away, three kilometers away. And when they're about to take a picture or video, there's no micro SD, okay? The good thing is the Mavic 2 Pro has an internal 8 gig, you know? It actually happened to me in Dolores Quezon in, uh, in uh, Bangkong Kahoy. A friend of mine um, borrowed the micro SD for a video presentation for, for Canon Philippines, no? Because he used my drone during the launch of the Canon R5 and R6. He forgot to... To, to return it. I flew my drone thinking that my micro SD was there, but it wasn't. But good thing it has an 8 gig internal memory and I was able to get the pictures. Yeah. So the third uh, pre-checklist is the flyer. You know? Okay, so the flyer, um, you have to be well rested because um, you have to operate it just viewing at your a small screen of your phone or your iPad. And you also have to have a line of sight, no? So vision and eyesight, you have to check. Um, you have to have a certification or license for commercial purposes, permits for private properties. So those are the things that, as a flyer, you should be responsible about, okay? So going to the basic app configuration. So this is the DJI Go app. Um, I will not go into details with this. You need to study this. Each and every one of this is very important, like the battery voltage, uh, aircraft status, how much battery do you have remaining before it can go back to you, return to home, GPS status. You need to check this, very important. You know? uh, auto takeoff, uh, go home, intelligent flight modes. Um, my, my pet peeve is that I need to know all of this button, so I study them. So I read the manual and everything. And I suggest you do so. Why? Because it helps you. When you're in the air, you cannot ask questions or you cannot Google things. You're already up there, and you only have 20 minutes to get the shot. So it's very important that you have to familiar, familiarize yourself with the DJI Go app. Okay. So important reminders. No? Always check and recalibrate your compass. Wherever you are, if you're flying for the first time there, calibrate your compass. If it doesn't give you that warning, still calibrate it, okay? I've learned a lot from my own experience. If you don't calibrate, you might lose your camera. It will fly away. Uh, there's, uh, there would be instances that it would fly away. Or it will not go home where it's supposed to be or the GPS for the location is not accurate, okay? So always calibrate. Ensure proper RTH and location. Do this every time at a new location, okay? It's so easy to calibrate it, okay? So this is this is usually my, my 30 seconds rule. I follow this religiously when I'm flying a drone. 30 seconds for final inspection of the unit and remote before activating the motor. 30 seconds to configure and check my RC settings, my remote control. Am I in manual mode? Am I in AV mode? Am I in video? Am I in photography mode? So I always check that, okay? Camera calibration is good. I just finish it, so that's it. Then 30 seconds, I hover it. I don't just fly away immediately. I let it hover for 15 to 30 seconds. Actually, 30 seconds is good enough just to have a GPS lock and to warm up your motors. It's very important to warm up your motors because if you don't warm up your motor, especially if you're in a cold climate, the problem is it will uh, it will advance the wear and tear, okay? So those are the things. This is my 30 seconds rule. So um, now if you want to know the basics of how to fly your drone, no? Um, so learn the basics of drone flight plus cap regulations with urban gadgets. So they also have a separate, they would have a separate uh, lecture on the basics of flying, the actual flying, no? Uh, batch is 2021, which is going to be launching soon. This is in coordination with uh, CAAP, 
no? So to learn the basics and with cap regulations. Okay, for traveling with drone, I've seen a lot of questions, how do I travel with my drone, no? Let's see. Uh, okay, so maraming uh, nanonood. So shout out to Christian Lim. Uh, he's a very good landscape photographer, good friend. He's also a DJ right now. So check it out. Uh, his mixes are really good for the 80s and 90s. Jeff Gonzalez, can human interest or adding people in the composition would increase the quality of your photo? Yes, adding human element is very good, no? Like you've seen some of my shots, I have some human element, no? Uh, what can you advise in, while flying over water? Um, pray. <laughs> I've flown my drone so many times um, away from the land and over the water. You can't do anything. Um, but there's some um, third-party accessories that you can put. Um, actually, I have one uh, with an inflatable, but the problem it adds weight. And also, there's a drag. When the wind is, your drone's going to be slower. So that's one of the things. No? So shout out to Sir Bo watching, Bo Apostol, Benjo Trinidad, uh, Jet Gubales, uh, so there, no? Bayan Dorj uh, from Mongolia. Hello. Hi. How are you? Okay. So now, um, for traveling with drone, I've been asked a lot of questions. Uh, Edwin, is it hard to travel with your drone? When I had the Phantom 4 Pro, yes. Actually, coming home from the Philippines, I took an Emirates uh, flight. Right there at the gate, they measure your hand carry. It's not usual, but sometimes they do this. And if it's over seven kilograms, then you have to pay. And I paid like about $100, $200 additional just for the excess weight because of my drone. Check airline and transport airport uh, transfer airport regulations on batteries and hand carry luggage specifications. If you're if you were able to travel after the pandemic, if your stopover is any major Chinese airport like Beijing, um, they only have a certain capacity of battery milliamperes that you can carry. So if you have five batteries or four batteries of your camera and drone, say goodbye to them. They're going to be confiscated if you pass by Beijing or any uh, major Chinese airport. No? Each country have different UAV regulations. You have to research. Iceland is more lenient, but they're, they have been more and more restrictions, especially on national parks. Uh, for Norway, you need to apply in advance. You have to give out your drone if it's especially above uh, seven kilograms. So you need to uh, do that also in France and other places. In the U.S., they have more restrictions. That's why I don't bring my drones when I go to the U.S. or Canada. Because most of the time, I would end up just not using it. Okay, But there are some places in the U.S. you can fly it, um, especially those that are not deemed as natural parks. Okay, um, And of course, when you're traveling with a drone in a different country, always calibrate. I could not stress out that you need to calibrate more, okay? So for to, to end our second module, um, fly safe and fly responsibly. Um, yung mga ninja moves, Jan, those who are flying in, with ninja moves, no? Um, do not gamble. I'm telling you, when, it, when accident happen, um, the cost, not only monetary, but also... If you injure someone, I think it's not um, it's not rewarding or it's not it's not fulfilling. If it's it's just not worth it. Okay, so let's go back and let's see if there's other questions that I can answer before we proceed to the second. Okay, okay. So any questions for us? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, So hi to Chris John Tingson from Visayas Negros Occidental, Levis Palapar from Palawan. Okay. So adding ele human elements, I've answered this, shooting in water. The limit of my drone is that I know my wife will kill me if it is lost. <laughs> um, you have to be very careful. But again, you cannot 
baby your your drone or you won't be able to maximize it. Like I fly my drone really high to get that perspective. Um, and part of me already accepts that if something happens to it, then it's okay. It, it's part of it's part of the fun. No? Uh, what is the drone feature that you have seen before that you should wish current drones to have? Um, so far, the new application has has given me all the things I want, um, except for a vertical, uh, a vertical. So they took this out from the Mavic One Pro. No, usually when you do vertical, you can switch the orientation of your screen from horizontal to vertical. So that is very important when you're visualizing via a vertical panorama. No, I think um, Mr. Jonathan Tabisara, also of Urban Gadgets, we hated this on the new Mavic 2 Pro because it doesn't have it. You know? So I wish they could bring it back. Kaya ba ng drone with stand ang putok ng kwitis? I don't think so. Mid clarification, is it true that when two drones are on the air, the other person can control and steal your drone? Um... So meet number one, um, the signal, no. You can interfere with each other's signal. But each remote, um, each drone and the remote, the D DJI Go app, they usually are um, connected to each other. They are paired together. No, There were some hacks that you can do it, but on a normal software, both of you, you fly together, there's no such thing. You can have interference like um, I run tours and sometimes five of us would fly a drone, five to seven of us would fly a drone. I would ask everyone to scatter around because if you fly together too close, you would see that lost connection or uh, you would see that your GPS signal would drop. So basically interference, um, there's more interference when you're together, close range. Uh, is it true that flying drones near airport can interfere in the signals of the airplane? There's no actual proof, but of course, if two drone operators together, when they fly together and causes interference on your remote or your the, the drone itself, then what more on a big aircraft? So that is the contention. But there were some there were some studies, especially on the newer Airbus, etc., which is more electrical, uh, that it can interfere. So yeah, it's true. So that's it. Maybe we can proceed with the. Uh, we can proceed again. On the next of my presentation. Let me check. Kirap na nagsasalita na magisa na walang kausap. Okay, I think this is the uh, most important. Uh, let me just get clarification from from my team if. The so kita na ba? Uh, do you see the presentation? Okay, so we're good. So now I'm gonna be tackling um, optimum settings now for maximizing your drone for landscape photography. So this was also taken in Lofoten in Skag Sanden Beach. This is a horizontal panorama. You would see some of my drone shops are more into panorama, no? Because it captures more and it's really unique, like this one, no? Um, for me, I was flying in water. I don't care. Actually, there were, we were two flying this 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 area. So one of them was Jonathan Tabisara, the owner of Urban Gadget. He was with me in in uh, Lofoten. Uh, I would like to invite everyone for 2022 probably, or in 2021, if it permits, Urban Gadgets will have a drone um, a drone tour in Iceland uh, during the summer. So details will be given out once it's ready and we're ready to travel now. So anyway, so we were flying here, and we were flying like about 300 meters above, above sea level. No? And we heard a helicopter coming in no so we panicked so both of us just dropped our 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 height and uh, took the shot then just landed the plane i think there was an emergency medical uh, that the rescue team was was going to 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 a certain area no so optimum settings raw 
and plus JPEG. I could not stress this. If you're going to fly your drone and take fo photos, please either if you're a JPEG shooter, then you should also get a raw shot. No, the DNG, uh, the DNG file of uh, DGI is really good. It, you can extract more details. No, so these are the advantages of JPEG and raw. In raw, you can have more. Uh, information. It's. It, I think it's about uh, um, the DNG file of uh, DGI is about 11 bit, 10 bit or 11 bit. No, so it's more information than a JPEG, which is 8 bit. No, um, and the compression of JPEG is bad. The only advantage it's easier to share, and the smaller file. No, um, so basically, in drone photography. Um, you need to know aperture, shutter, and ISO. Most drones right now are automatic. They take care of it. But me, I'd like to do it manually. Why? I'd like a cleaner ISO. I usually shoot at the lowest ISO, which is ISO 100. Aperture, I'd like to put it at the sharpest aperture possible of that particular drone. I'll tell you later what, what are the, 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 the sharpest. No Shutter, of course, the slower, the slower your shutter, the more nyarp or not sharp your photo is going to be you know? so these are the settings that I, I recommend for i usually put it on manual mode meaning um, there's aperture and manual mode and shutter mode you can usually change it you no know? so you have to know your dji go app practice it you no know? so aperture if you fly with the one and two third sensor your sharpest would be at f2.8 it has a smaller sensor, f2.8, it's already sharp. For one inch sensor, I find it, especially for the Mavic 2 Pro, it's sharp at 5.6 aperture. So I always set my aperture at 5.6, okay? ISO 100 to 200, that's the cleanest. Anything above 100 to 200, I'm sorry, but with the one inch sensor, even if you have one inch sensor, noise is so bad, no? Shutter speed, it has to be times two of the focal length. If you have a 28 millimeter focal view, then you should have at least one over 50 to one over 60 shutter speed, okay? So those are the optimum settings for your drones. Okay, let me check. Which mode is safer, either GPS mode? Okay, of course, GPS mode. Um, GPS mode is much, uh, of course, safer. ATTI um, is more on the professional no especially when you're have so many magnetic interference then you fly ATTI but for me I like to use the GPS mode it's safer there's a fail safe system in the GPS mode okay uh, for white balance I usually put it to auto white balance no now um, the most important part for me or uh, function, especially in your DJI Go app, is the histogram. So what is the histogram? So this is a shot of uh, of the field of, of uh, lava fields in, in Iceland. Now, histogram is usually this one. You would see it, it's just a small window on the DJI Go app. I suggest you turn it on so you can see it. Now, what is the histogram? So to explain further the histogram, this is the parts of the histogram. The left side is called the shadows. It, it, it correlates about information captured in the shadow area. The middle one is midtones. Okay. Uh, then the right most part is the highlights. Okay. I always suggest that you have a healthy histogram, meaning it's not much bunched to the left, not much bunched to the right. No. But the most important is you do not clip your highlights because. White is the absence of information. If you blow your highlights or clip your highlights, you have no information that you can save. Shadow area, you can, but details would be with no, more noise, etc. No? So, like, for example, this shot. This is the histogram of uh, this shot. No, um, What I'm going to do is if the shutter speed is 1 over 40, let's say F5.6, ISO 100, what I'll do is increase my shutter speed to 1 over, let's say, 60 or 1 over 100 to correct it. You know? So remember that. Um, I'd rather have an underexposed shot, especially for drones, an underexposed shot than a blown highlight you know? because you can, never, um, you, can never, you can never 
recover it. Okay. Um, but for me, I always shoot, I always bracket my shot. When I shoot single shots and not panorama, even in panorama, I bracket my shots. Okay. So I'll tell you about bracketing later. So this one, if you would look at it, it's too dark. Now, if you look at it, all the details is bunching up on the left side, so the shadow area. So these are clip shadows. If you have, let's say, 1 over 200 at f5.6 ISO 100, uh, what I'm going to do is I'll put it to 1 over 100, and you would see that the histogram would move in the middle. You, know? you have to get it right while you're in the air because you only have like 20 minutes to 25 minutes. And for, for the Mavic, Mavic Air, you only have like 15 minutes of flight time. And you have to maximize your flight time. Okay, so the histogram is a good tool. This is one of the things that I always look at when I capture my uh, still photos. I also bracket. So what are bracket? I usually, there's an automatic mode that you can bracket your shots. So you have single photo, then you have bracketing, either three shots or five shots, and then you have the panoramic modes. No? So usually I would bracket my shots. I always take three shots, underexposed, normal exposure, overexposed. So basically, then I blend them together in post-processing. You know? Blend best exposure of each shot for less noise and better details. Like, for example, the correct exposure in the middle, I would get this portion. Then for the overexposed, I would get those with the shadowed area and the sky for the underexposed shots. So with that, I could get a really good shot. For focusing... Um, use the AF or auto function, um, autofocus function of your drone. Never do manual focusing. I never do manual focusing on my drone because it's so hard when you're looking at a screen, a small screen, and you're outside. You will never see it. So I trust the autofo autofocus function of the drone. No? Usually it's in hyperfocal distancing. So... You can also activate focus peaking to see where it focuses. I usually do this, especially for very, um, for very important shots. I use focus peaking. So you would see this. Um, you can you see that it's in AF, and then you can just choose the point where you're going to focus. You know? Then uh, in peak focus threshold, so you can also put uh, focus peaking so you can see where it's actually focusing. It would be a red line or blue line, so you can assign a color for it. Okay, so that's very important. So those are the settings that I find very important with, with uh, especially uh, um, for flying your drone for photography. So again, just to recap, manual mode. So best aperture, one and two-third sensor, f2.8. One inch sensor is 5.6. ISO is 100 to 200, shutter speed above the field of view or focal length of the camera, okay? So, I'd like to welcome uh, Harry CEO from Cagayan de Oro is watching. Uh, Chris John Tingson, okay ba gumamit ng zebra line? Yes, yes, it's okay. Um, I think it's very, um, um, especially for highlights. Oops, stop sharing. There we go. It's very important to use a zebra or the, um, the zebra line to, to check if you have um, overexposed areas. I use it. So when once I see it, I would downplay the shutter speed or make it faster. So that's it. Uh, okay, so ano pa bang mga question? Okay, Jarel Gonzalez, hi, watching from Pasig City. Jarel Gonzalez, are you using JPEG or RAW? I use RAW. I answered it. Um, I answered it, and I hope it's it's. Um, I hope uh, the RAW plus JPEG aspect answered your question. Drone weight in relation to regulation. I've read the strict regulation. Yes, uh, I did. I did. Um, I did tackle it already, especially for the Philippines. I think it's seven kilograms. Wait, let me sh let me. <clears throat> Wait. So the regulation right now. Um, so anything that weighs seven kilograms or fifteen pounds or more, uh, if your drone weighs more than seven seven kilograms, you must obtain a certificate from the cop. So that is the regulation right now. Okay. And that's it. 
Um, so we'll proceed to the second to the last part of my presentation, which is, I think, the most important. How do you compose using your drone and taking a landscape shot using a drone? So I think that's very important because <clears throat> mobility is a very mobility is very hard, especially when you're up in the air, like 150 feet or 90 feet or <clears throat> excuse me. So that's very important, no? And um, um, I think uh, Urban Gadgets will replay this, um, and hopefully you can you can really enjoy the lecture that I'm gonna be presenting. So I'll be sharing the screen. Let's go to the second to the last presentation. Okay, share. Then. Ah, hindi pa pala. Filters muna. Okay. So, let's go to filters. Okay. Before I go to the last part, which is the composition. No? So, filters. Um, a lot of people are asking me if I use filters in my drone. Actually, yes. I never take it off, especially the CPL. So, I have a CPL actually in my drone. CPL is very important. Um, it improves the the clarity of the picture, the aesthetics of the picture. And I think um, a drone owner should have filters with him. No? So filters. So this shot was taken in um, in Vesterhorn in Iceland. So I was using, I think, a DJI Mavic 1 when I took this shot. I had a CPL to get more of the colors and also to lessen the reflection from, from the sun. No? So why use filters? Improves the overall look of the photo or video. You can also, mm -hmm. it, you can also have um, or do surreal effects like uh, slow shutter speeds, okay? So, ayo mandar, bakit? Okay, play, there we go. There we go. Okay, here we go. So, look at these two photos. The photo on the left is without filters. The photo on the right is with filters, okay? So you can see there's more details in the sky. I use a CPL in this shot. Um, and the saturation is much better. So I usually use the Polar Pro filters. It's available uh, with Urban Gadgets. I think... Um, the owner should have it. I have the Vivid series. It, the, the, the colors comes out really fantastic and uh, more, more apparent or distinct. You know? So this, I use a Polar Pro ND4 CPL Vivid series. I've never taken this off, actually. Still in my drone. When I fly my drone, I, only when I fly um, like close to sunset or sunrise, that's the time I take it off. Okay, because it's darker, I need a more faster shutter speed. Uh, so CPL and ND, different use and different purpose. I use Polar Pro filters. So this is the, so you have ND8, ND16, ND32, ND8PL, ND16PL. What I use is the PL version. It means that it has eight, st uh, in ND8 is three stops. So it has a three stops and it also works as a CPL. So it's a combination. I usually, I just bought the 3.1, the 4, 8, and the 16. Above that, I don't use it. Why? Because your camera is flying and camera shake is very apparent or very, it, it will happen, especially in slow shutter speed, even in tripod mode. So I only would go like 1 over 4 or even 1 second that's pushing it. So for me to do that, um, ND16 is enough. No? I think they have the Vivid series for this. So CPL is actually much better because it reduces reflection or glare from uh, shiny surfaces. It deepens the blueness of the sky uh, and those stuff. It makes the clouds pop out. It saturates the colors of vegetation. No? So, bakit? Hmm, weird. There we go. So look at this. This shot, I took, uh, I took this with the CPL, no? so it's over the glare. Uh, this one also, uh, I took it with the CPL to get the green color, no? 
and the brownish color of the of the waves that this this boats are are doing. I took this in uh, Bukidnon, okay, near CDO. So neutral density it provides the effect. It cuts light entry, and you can use slow shutter effect. So look, take a look at the shot. This was taken with a one second exposure. For me to get that slow shutter speed of the waterfall, chaka yung trail na ganon. I know it's not enough, uh, but still the effect is there. Now, um, usually it's hard when your camera is flying and the winds are there. There's a lot of elements that can make your photo not sharp. So I, for slow shutter, I usually do it like not so often. You know? So. This is one of the instances. Um, final reminders for filters. Get the best brand, usually pro filters. Keep your filters clean. When you fly them, I usually clean my filters. Okay, Any smudge, you would see it when you're processing your photos. So it's very important. Okay. So uh, question here does Ur by Benjo Trinidad. Does Urban Gadget have NDPL filters for the Mavic 2 Pro? Yes, I think so. Um, I think Crystal or Sir Jonathan can answer it in the comment section. Uh, so that's it. Nagagamit niyo po ba ang CPL or pu puro ND filters? CPL, palagi nakakabit sa... Uh, I never take it off. The CPL for me is the most often used. It's my often used filter for my drone. Okay. So all the shots that you've seen here, CPL yan. May ND4PL. Okay. So how do you take good care of your batteries and what percentage do you store them? Um, usually, I store them in a dry box. And um, number one, I cycle them. So I put one, two, three. Uh, I mark my battery. So after one, I make sure I use two, three, and four. So I never use the same battery twice in the same day. <clears throat> then second, when I store them, I know that, like, for example, now, I usually store them at 10% or 15%. I never store them at 50% capacity. 20% below, you can store it safely. You know? And I think the most important here is store it in a dry cabinet. Humidity can also cause it to bloat. Okay, So that's it. And we'll go now to the last of my presentation, which is the longest also, which is... Composition. I think this is the most important part in, um, in, in, in any aspect of photography, even videography, you know? um, cinematography, the color grading, etc. It's nice, but the way you compose your frame, it's very important. You know? I think this is the most critical part. So look at the shot. This was taken in, again, the highlands of Iceland. So I use colors and abstract patterns to present my, my landscape. So this is an actual island with the volcano or pseudo craters. They call it pseudo craters in a heart-shaped lagoon. You know? So it's all about visual design. I think this is the most important aspect when you fly a drone is how to compose. You know? So different perspective doesn't make the photograph. Composition does. Okay, Always remember that. Not because you have a drone, your photos will turn out much better. No, composition is still the king. Okay. Okay, so great photography is about implementing your vision with great design. What do I mean by this? Um, when you fly a drone, you fly it with a reason. You've researched the place, you know where to go, you know what to take a photo. That's how I fly my drone. No? It's about implementing what I already want and just implementing it with, with a good solid design dynamics. No? So what do I mean by that? So vision is all about intention, all about concept. What do you want? Intimate landscape ba? Panorama? So what do you want to capture? What do you want to achieve? It's very important. No? So intention, are you going to shoot a scholar or monochrome? Are you going to shoot slow or fast exposure? Are you going to put a human element? Are you going to shoot panorama 180? horizontal or vertical. So when you fly, you only have 25 minutes and this one, <coughs> you should have already made up your mind what to do. That's the secret when you're flying with your drone, 
you fly with intent, okay? So like this one, when I flew my drone, I saw that the clouds were breaking up. So immediately after calibrating and the 30 second rule that I did, I flew my drone and I went really close to the glacier. This is the glacier uh, in, uh, in Iceland called Sevinifes Jokul, no? Yoku, Sevinifes Jokul. So some of the Icelandics who are watching this probably having a laugh, me pronouncing how to pronounce it, but I think I got it right. Anyway, so I just waited for my drone um, uh, just, I just hovered my drone on a certain spot, the composition I like, and I waited for the clouds to, to disperse and this shaft of light appeared and I took bracketed shots and this is the, and this is how it worked. No? Your intention will dictate the outcome of your work. So if you have no intention when you're flying your drone and just exploration, it is also good, but it will not have the best result, okay? Yeah, main ingredient for a great design. So ano ba to? You should have a visual workflow. I always follow this, maybe it in a DSLR on a drone photography, okay? So ano ba yung visual workflow ko? Creative, it's a creative process from start to end. It requires planning even before you go to the spot. It's a process of elimination, okay? So number one, location. I think the most important. Location, location, location. In any business, location is very important. In photography, location is also very important. Framing, how you frame your scene. Are you going to do a vertical panorama? Are you going to do a 180 panorama? Going to do just single shots? Are you going to do abstract? So those are the things that you have, you have to, to find out. No? Perspective. Okay, so that's it. Are you going to do vertical, horizontal? So those are the stuff. Like, for example, what location will you photograph? For example, you go to two hours away from here. Let's say you go to Dolores, Bangkong Kahoy. So what is the aesthetic place of the, of the place, aesthetic value of the place? I know that there are two mountains there, Banahaw and Mount Cristobal. Okay, and there's a valley in between them. Perfect. That is the aesthetic value of the place. Does it have interesting elements? Yes, the valley and the two mountains. Okay, have you explored all spots? That's the time that you need to, you know, reserve one battery for exploration and one battery to get the shots. In other words, does the place have the potential? So that's it. If you've answered all this question and you have a place in mind, then research it, okay? Now, this is just a sample. Now, this is a, like, for example, this place has so many locations that's potential. I use my drone also to scout potential locations for DSLRs, no? like this one, reflection pool, like this one. And this one is, uh, is the sand dunes, okay? Then I take my shots here. So with my drone, I was able also to, to check out other potential locations for landscape photography using a DSLR. Then you have the waves, Okay, then you have the cliff. Okay, so with my drone, I was able to, to check out a lot of locations. Exploration is always the key, okay? Now this shot, I have never, when I took this shot, I have never seen any other shots of Lofa 10 with this shot. Um, in terms of date, and if you research uh, drone shots of Lofa 10, Hamnoi, I think my shot would have the oldest date, okay? So you need to explore everything. And I think the best tool will be Google Earth or Google Map. Google Earth is much better because it has a 3D and it's updated every time. <clears throat> like, for example, this one, Tagaytay. I was planning to go to Tagaytay um, just before it had, like, seismic activity again. I saw some shots of friends of, like, from Jilson Q., who took also drone shots, uh, their group took, took. So I was planning it. I was supposed to go last week, but then eruptions happened and restrictions were were imposed, so I wasn't able to go. But I already researched, so I knew how to take the shots and everything. You would see that Taal Volcano is perfect for drone shots. You, know, you can already imagine your shots just using the Google Earth. Like, for example, if you choose Bohol, uh, the Chocolate Hills, would it be really good for top view shots or or drone shots. For top view shots, I don't think it's going to be good. 
if you look at Google Earth, it's just lumps of, of you know, of these things. So for top view shots, I know Bohol would not be perfect. So it might might be perfect shooting it uh, sideways, horizontally, or vertically for Vertoramas. Okay. So Google Earth is your best friend when trying to scout for an area and how to use it. Okay. So again, location is very important. You have to know that the location has potential. And you can use Google Earth to check it. Uh, you can also fly your drone. Um, you can allocate one battery just for exploring, then take the shot on the second battery. You know? Framing. Um, framing is very important. So this one, for example, when I took this shot, I wanted the crater to be a leading line okay, towards the frame. So when I took the shot, um, I used the lagoon, okay, the volcanic, the, the volcanic lagoon as my foreground element as the anchor point, then lead your uh, eyes towards to the rest of the frame. So that's very important, okay? Uh -huh. Okay, so, oop. so in framing, um, there's always two things that you want to capture, the grand scene or the abstract. Um, for me, I always take two of them when I go to a place, you know? so let me explain. For the grand scene, Use the rule of thirds, geometrics, and the use of dynamic lines. Then always look for interest layers. So this was taken in Caleraya. I just converted to black and white. Single shot, top view. Always place your interest elements in one third of the bot. Uh, sorry, on the one third uh, aspect of the frame. No, so on the intersecting points. This would make your photo more balanced. Okay, or uh, more interesting. You know? So these are basic guides or leading lines. So this is in Detifos, one, the most, uh, the second most powerful waterfall in Europe. And um, I use the cliff as my leading line. You know? So you have leading lines, diagonal lines. Most of my shots would contain this. Why? They are effective in engaging the viewer. It leads the viewer towards the frame. So I always look for diagonal lines in my frame. So like this one, this was taken uh, during the workshop of Urban Gadgets in Eastwood. And I used the, the, the what do you call this? The canal, no? The, as leading line, diagonal lines, okay? Or even this one, no? It, it's not apparent, but you could see a diagonal line crossing towards the brightest point of the frame, which is the sun. So always look for diagonal lines. For me, diagonal lines are the most dynamic of all lines. Bucket, because it directs visual path, meaning the viewer engages in the photo. He, is, he or she is directed towards to where you want the photo starts and ends, okay? So roads or your curves are also good. I have a lot of curves as a leading line. They're also dynamic, and they also gives you gives you a, a leading line path. No? So another one, curves. I use roads as part of the curve. This is in Norway. This one is in uh, highlands of uh, North Iceland. Okay. This one was taken just last year, no? just before the pandemic, curves. And this one, even in my abstract, I use curves. This is a this is a glacier river, running through a volcanic uh, area. Okay, so it melts the snow. It's a geothermal area, and has this aqua blue colors. The steam, the water, it's perfect, no. And there's the bridge in the middle. That's a footbridge in the middle. No? So curves are very important, also. So, interest layers. Always look for interest layers also on your um, on your photo on your photograph. You should have like so many layers, especially on a vertical panorama, from bottom to up to the top portion, or on a horizontal panorama, left to right or right to left. Okay, you should have interest layers. Like for this, this one, you have the river, 
you have the green meadows, then you have the mountains, then you have the clouds. So those are the interest layers. You should have always interest layers in your composition. Or this one, you have the volcano, uh, the crater, uh, the mountains, and the sky. So interest layers are very important. Okay, do we get a certificate for attending? This is a live version. I don't think I, uh, they will issue a certificate for it. Uh, but thanks, barely, barely a lane. Okay. Um, so I've discussed that. So geometrics, uh, <clears throat> leading lines, especially dynamic lines, are very important. So interest layers, dynamic lines, very important. Now, abstract or intimate landscape. This is one of my favorite, actually especially top view when you can put your camera on a on a <clears throat> on 90 degrees yeah 90 degrees of course yeah so 90 degrees and just shooting downwards no use of geometrics hard line shapes such as circular or square for abstracts these are very important because it defines that you are shooting something abstract use of contrast and colors are very important for shooting abstracts no so <clears throat> Note, these are often taken on a top view perspective, as I said earlier. So let me show you some samples. Look at this. Two circular coming from the crater, okay? Circular and other geometrics. It's very important to find them, okay? Or this one. This is also a crater. So you could see the stairs. Then you could see the lines, two lines of the crater, okay? Always look for hard line objects when you're photographing abstracts because they are very graphic Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Jonil. Amazing answer and composition. Big help for practice. Okay. Thank you. So another one. Okay. It's this one. Okay. Like curves. So I use a slow shutter here one second because I like the lines that the, uh, and the curves, the circular. Okay. The si semi-circular of the waterfall. This was taken uh, in North Iceland. This is Godafoss, the waterfall of the gods uh, or this one rectangulars hard line so always look for that because it is really nice for abstracts or intimate landscapes okay square rectangles and other geometrics like this one pagsanghan falls you have straight lines of the river then you have this a tiny pond with also graphic straight lines okay or this one, you have the vertical lines coming from the waves. These are ice icebergs. This this is this was taken in the Black uh, um, Diamond Ice Beach in in Jokulsarlon in Iceland. So these are gigantic. Some are big as, as big as cars. These icebergs are big, <coughs> big of uh, big as cars. And these are waves that are taller than me, six feet. You know? So this was taken on a top view. So you could see it formed the, the, the white wash of the receding waves. It formed that like similar trees or flowers. And the iceberg looked like flowers or branches. You know? So this is very important uh, question from Chris John. Uh, ganu, ganu po ko important yung grid line to take a photo? I always have the grid line in my photo, both in my camera and my drones in my remote, the DJI Go app. Grid lines will help you put your subjects into the rule of thirds. So always activate your grid lines. I usually use three by three, no? which is normal for the best. Nor, uh, the, uh, for me, the best also for taking photographs. Okay, abstract geometrics like this one. No, So always look for... Also, um, I think one of the things that I always uh, tell my participants always look for the extraordinary especially if you can like this one if to take a look at this photo what do you see especially on the lava field yung foreground element when i took the shot i i i, I actually took um, i i mean i took a look at, i i went to take a look at the screen more than i should you no know? because i could see a face of a giant you know, when i was taking this i said is this real? I said, parang face ng giant. I even showed it to to, to my co to, to one of the participants. Hey, do you see this? What do you what do you think of this? I said, it's look like it looks like a face. So 
take those things. Do look always for those things because it's very, it tells a story. Okay, so when you're looking for this, yeah. So abstract geometrics. So contrast is also important. What are contrasts? Okay, colors, like for example, this one, you would see mountains and then you would see structures, man-made structures. These are contrasts. But also I have leading line, no? I have the shapes. But of course, color and color is the biggest thing that you can have in contrast. So you have warm colors, then you have the bluish tints of the of the buildings. So this one presents a lot of contrast. No? So this was taken in Pico de Loro in Batangas, Nasugbu, Batangas. Okay. Or this one, contrast of color. So you have the water and the greenish, uh, green fields or lava moss of the island and the craters. No? So colors, very important. Okay, perspective. Okay, wait, wait. Okay, perspective, maximizing the use of height and width. I think it's very, thank you, RD, breathtaking images. Okay, thank you, RD Lopez. Hello. So perspective, maximizing the use of height and width. Um, I think it's very important. One of my biggest use of the DJI Go app is the panorama. I always use the panorama, okay? So look at this. This is a single shot of the Mavic 1 Pro, okay? Uh, I took the Glacier River, the valley, which the Glacier River is flowing, and the mountains in the highlands of Iceland. And then I took an abstract shot. So after taking that, I took an abstract shot of the Glacier River. After that, I went farther, then I took a 180 panorama in just one battery. So I was able to deal with all the perspective. When you fly your drone, you maximize composition. Take the normal shot, bracket it, then take an intimate shot, to take the photo, then fly it out more, take the wide panoramic views, either horizontal, 180, or vertical. Always maximize, so this one, look, man. maximize your airtime. I cannot stress this out. When you're composing, maximize your airtime. Make use of all perspective and angle in one location. Again, I'll show you this. So I went to this island. This island was about three kilometers from the parking lot. So I went there, Mavic Air. I thought the battery would not last until it goes back. But when I was able to go here, I see there was enough battery. So first, I took this shot, straight shot, raw shot, bracketed. Then later on, I went and took some detail shots, abstract. Okay, So I took a couple. You've seen some of the pictures. I took like five or six. Then flying back to the parking, to my location or home, I took the panoramic. Okay, this is a panoramic shot, about 21 photos, 180. Okay, always maximize your airtime when you're photographing. Try to capture all perspective. Okay, the single shot, bracketed, or single composition, abstract, panoramic. Okay, we can have so coffee. I hope this is being recorded. Anthony Makla, I, I, I think it's being recorded. I just don't know if they're going to put it uh, in the website or the Facebook, but I think they will. Awesome workshop. Oh, awesome. awesome workshop. Okay. So again, this shot is one of my favorite shots, actually. Um, when I'm, uh, I always remember this place and I discovered this place looking at the Google Maps. No? And also, uh, um, my co-guide, uh, Brynjar, in Iceland, uh, he was saying, hey, look at it in the Google Maps. And, I, and I, when I saw it, I said, wow, perfect. So, yeah. Technique. Okay. I think uh, in composition, technique is very important. No? So what are the techniques that you can use, especially for the DJI Go app? Panorama. So this is a vertical panorama. This is 180 panorama, okay? This is also 180 panorama. Try to use the panorama. I'm telling you, it provides a different perspective, especially 
if you plan your shot. When you're doing panorama, you simulate it by moving your gimbal already. Okay? Usually, the, the drone will take it one shot, middle, up, down, move it either left or right. I think left. Uh, yeah, left. Then doing it three like this. Okay? So you have to know what you're photographing. Do not waste your air time. If you want a panorama, then try to position yourself when you can capture more of the interest elements. Okay? So like this one. I always put it in the middle, then capture the mountain ranges here and the light show here. So when I flew it out about five kilometers from the shoreline, okay, my parking, and it, yeah, I was like on that dots there on the, on the right side, no? So I made sure that the, the, the main island with the road was in my middle. So when I took the shot, it has to be in the middle. So when it took it, it took everything into account. Okay, Yun. so um, as I said, calibrate your IMU and compass every time. Horizon must be leveled. It's very important the IMU is calibrated or you have always a tilted horizon and your panorama would never be perfect. I don't usually calibrate it every time. But for example, if I don't use my, my, my drone for like now, six months, before I use it, I calibrate everything. Invest on a sun hood or FPB monitor. It makes viewing your composition better. Okay, if you're only using a phone or an iPad, iPad is much better. But usually I have a dedicated phone for my drone with a FPV monitor. Okay, first person view monitor. Make sure your bracket when you're using single shot or even panorama. Okay, then make use of panorama mode, vertical, horizontal, 180, 360, not too much for me, but that's it then always check your battery level. And with that, I end my uh, presentation. I think uh, that's enough time for from 6 o'clock to almost 8 o'clock. Uh, let me go back to the screen and stop sharing. Okay. Yun. Salamat, an avid follower from Bird Landscape to Nature. Kasama ka ngayon sa drone photography. Yes. Um, let me check what are the questions. Okay. Hope pagkaroon ng training for starters lang sa drone. I think they have one. Uh, is the use of filters applicable for the mini? Any drone, if you put a filter, it's going to be applicable. Maybe a Spark, Mini, Mavic uh, Mini, or Mavic Air. You can do it. No. Thank you, Renz Austria. Uh, he said, thank you, Sir Edwin, for this in workshop and also to Urban Gadgets. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, from Jet Gonzalez Subaba, amazing shots. Indeed, a master of what you're teaching. Kudos to UG for tapping the right resource person. Yes, Urban Gadget has been tapping the, I think the, the 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 right persons for their workshops. So in their future workshops, you, if you if you're available, just watch it. I think they'll have a series uh, right after mine. Uh, Palawan tayo, boss. Yes, when the right time comes, when the pandemic is over, no. Uh, thank you, Sir Jonathan, for the opportunity, the owner. Jel Hernayas, very inspiring. Thank you. Junra, thank you. Jordan, thank you then also if you've learned a lot as a beginner. No? So um, with that, I think uh, I've taken much of your time and uh, thank you very much. And again, fly safely and fly responsibly. And I hope you can apply this to your future flights. Okay. So good night and mabuhay. Breathtaking. It was like a dream. A painting. A painting where you can live in. It takes me. It captures me. It always leaves me in awe. 
This is how landscapes fascinate me. It makes me want to freeze time every time I see this painted light scenery with my two eyes. This is the reason why I continue living the story. The story within the photographs of this awesome scenery. Going back and forth just to experience the awesome wonders of this world. It's beautiful. It's beautifully made. That capturing this picture-perfect landscape is just what I need. What we all need. Living the story behind the photos is what we need. I am Edwin Martinez, travel and landscape photographer and Canon Crusader of Life.